All right, let's get started. So last time we talked about cross-site scripting, and so today we're talking about the defenses against cross-site scripting. Um, so first, though, some admin. Uh, so this Thursday is the guest lecture on browser fingerprinting by Pete Snyder uh, from Brave Browser. Uh, and feel free to invite friends or anyone who you think might be interested to come. Uh, and this Friday, the assignment one is due. So hopefully that's going well. I noticed there's a lot of questions going through on Piazza, so it seems like people are making progress. Uh, there's going to be office hours, of course, this week, so come in if you're having problems or if you're stuck in any way. Cool. So just to review, last time we talked about cross-site scripting, and the basic idea was we have uh, user data that we're combining with some kind of uh, code. And uh, when we do that, if the user input is specially crafted, then it can produce uh, a resulting page which uh, runs the attacker's code. Um, and what we want to try and do is actually escape the user input so that it's treated by the browser just as user input and not as actual code, right? Uh, and remember, the context here is that uh, the attacker is trying to get this code to run in a browser of, of some user of our website. Um, and so if the attacker succeeds, then this code is running in one of our users' Uh, users' browsers, and uh, they're presumably logged in or they're viewing some kind of sensitive information. And so it's, it's not our website server that's getting attacked, it's the user's browser who's visiting our website that's getting attacked. Okay, so uh, we also talked about there was two kinds of, of cross-site scripting, reflected and stored. Um, so remember, reflected is uh, a bit uh, easier, uh, or, or sorry, not easier, but rather um, a bit less powerful um, in the sense that uh, we're only sort of able to manipulate like a URL. Um, and if, we, if, if the attacker manipulates the URL in some way, they might be able to get the server to reflect back some piece of data that was in that URL uh, and, and in a way that you know, uh, it, it's treated as code by the, by the end user's browser. Um, and in stored XSS, the attack code is somehow added into the database. And then um, it gets uh, ref sort of uh, returned by the server um, on potentially any number of different responses. Um, so it's a little bit more powerful there. Any questions about that? Cool, so it's all review, yeah, so that's good. Um, so one thing I was thinking about is um, a way of thinking about what's actually going on here in both of these types of attacks. Um, this might be a useful way to think about uh, cross-site scripting. So there's like different sort of um, context shifts that are going on in, when we're doing, when an attacker is producing an attack like this. Um, and uh, so sometimes we're injecting downward by creating a new context where one wasn't expected. Um, and then other times we're sort of doing the reverse. We're sort of like ending a context and sort of going, going back up. Um, so, so what do I mean by like this down and up? Well, re remember the DOM is, uh, you know, it's, it's a tree. So it's sort of this tree structure of all of the HTML tags on our page. So some tags have other tags in them which have other tags in them. So it's this tree structure. And so we can sort of go down by adding a new context into a, a node that wasn't expecting that to happen, or sort of go up into context and go up into a, like a, a different uh, um, a context. And so if you look at the code here, so what's going on in this case, um, or, you know, where, where our user data was a script, this, is, this would be, is this down or up in this case? Down, right? Okay, yeah, exactly, because we sort of added a new node into the, into this, into the DOM. Uh, and then in this example here, um, we, were, uh, we were putting user data into an attribute, and the attack was sort of to uh, oh, I guess I copied the wrong thing here. This is this is actually properly escaped. So this isn't this 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 isn't the actual attack in this situation. But say that we were able to sort of escape out of this, this would be uh, injecting up, right? So ending ending the context of uh, being in an attribute and sort of being now out into sort of uh, being able to here to create our own attributes, right? Cool. So um, so yeah. So the idea behind these defenses is that. Um, well, just to review, the core problem is this untrusted user data being combined with code. So actually, I think the name cross-site scripting is a little bit misleading. We should probably be calling it HTML injection. Um, and that sort of parallel, parallels nicely with what we're going to talk about later, which is SQL injection and other kinds of server-side injections. But basically, the idea is we're, we're sort of inserting new unexpected HTML. And so, uh, so our, our solution is to escape or to sanitize this user input before combining it with the code. And we, we talked about the different characters we have to worry about last time. Um, and so, um, where can all this untrusted user data, user data come from? We have uh, HTTP requests from the user, so query parameters, form fields, headers, cookies, all kinds of data that comes from the user, we have to worry about this. Um, but also data from a database, because we don't know how the data got into the database. 
Um, so this data could be, um, could be uh, added by any number of, of different people on your team, um, and you don't know whether that data is sort of in a clean format that you can just sort of dump into your page. And so you have to be sort of conservative and uh, do not trust it um, and escape it sort of on the way out, right? And there's also third-party services. Sometimes you get data from a third-party service. Who knows if it's safe? Who knows if it's, if it's returning you data that you can just blindly add to your page? Um, furthermore, even if it is returning data that you can blindly add to your page, what if tomorrow the service is hacked and now it's returning uh, data that you, that you can't trust? So better to design your, your code in a conservative way where when you get data back from anybody, you uh, ensure that it's safe to add to your page before you just add it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot. No worries. Just feel free to always remind me if I forget. <laughs> cool. All right, so, uh, so when do we want to escape? So uh, I sort of mentioned this before, but uh, you, we have sort of two choices. You could escape on the way into the, the, the database, uh, or you could sort of escape on the way out at the time you're sort of rendering your page. Um, and this is more for the stored XSS, but uh, what are some of the trade-offs here? What do we think we would, we would prefer to do? In this, uh, you know, in, for this trade-off, yeah. Uh, I think that it's best to escape on the way in because then you need to do compliance and stuff like that. Uh, if you're escaping, you don't get to do that many things that are usually the case that escape the app. That's true. Yeah. So if you do it on the way out, you're going to be repeatedly doing it. Uh, the, the the downside of doing it on the way in, though, is you don't necessarily know the context in which that content is going to appear. Um, and remember last time there was all these different contexts we could put the content. We could put it you know, inside of an HTML tag or in an attribute or in a script uh, string. Uh, and because we don't know, we don't really know where our, our uh, data is going to appear, it's actually safest to just assume that, we, that, it, that it's, it hasn't been escaped and to just do that at the time of rendering because that's where we actually know where, oh, we're, I'm, I'm about to take this string and put it inside of this context or inside of that context and we can make the correct decision at that time. So, yeah, um, it, I mean, if you, if you it, I'm, not to, I'm not saying you can't do it correctly that way, you totally could, if you know for sure that you're gonna be using it in particular contexts. But in general, um, in general, it's, it's, it's uh, preferred to do it at the time you're uh, producing the HTML string. Does that make sense? Cool, uh, so yeah, always on the way out at render time. Um, and I think I sort of said this. You don't know, really know in advance um, what context that is going to appear, and, and every context has different escape characters we have to worry about. Um, the other thing too is, you know, you might have somebody on your team who, uh, somebody you know, who, who's not you, because you're, you're going to write perfect code, but some other person is going to show up, and they're not going to know that, uh, you know, we have a policy here at uh, at this company of always escaping our data. Uh, at, at, you know, at the time we add it to the database. So somebody might write some script that just dumps more entries into the database that, aren't, that are not following your rules, and then now you're in trouble. Cool, so, uh, so how, do we, how do we actually do this escaping? So I mentioned, um, you know, we, we sort of went over some of the things where, you know, we talked about which characters we would need to be, wor be worried about, um, but actually most web frameworks come with built-in HTML escaping functionality, and so you should just use that. Um, and there's this cool uh, law, uh, Coined after, uh, named after uh, Linus Torvalds from the Linux project, which is called Linus's Law. And it's uh, basically the idea is, given enough eyeballs, uh, all bugs are shallow. And so this just means that uh, you know, if you're using code that's depended upon by a ton of people, and it's in your framework, um, and it's open source, um, we hope that somebody will find problems in that code if, if problems exist, uh, versus if you write your own escaping functions, and then you, uh, you know, you're the only one using them, uh, now you're not really sure if it's correct or not until you're attacked. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, this doesn't always turn out to be true in practice. Like, there was a, a, a famous bug called Heartbleed, which was uh, actually in plain sight for many, many years, and people didn't discover it for a really long time. Um, so this doesn't always prove to be true. And in fact, sometimes, uh, and sometimes it's the opposite, because uh, people think, well, oh, it's open source. I'm sure that thousands of people have looked at this and, and have audited it, so I don't need to bother. Um, and so my, oftentimes people might, might actually um, worry less about open source code than um, if it was code, code that, that they themselves wrote or something like that. But anyway, I, I, I'm going um, off on a tangent. So uh, yeah, so basically uh, the idea is to just know, um, uh, 
to know how your, fr your particular framework provides HTML scaping functionality and to just use that. And also, you need to know it's not just enough to blindly use it. Again, the reason why we went over all this stuff is because it, it's not actually not enough to just say, oh, my framework takes care of it, because there's all these different contexts we talked about. So um, you need to know what exactly it's escaping um, your, um, your untrusted data uh, for. Uh, so for example, if you're using HTML scaping, you can't just take that output and put it into a string in a script tag unless it's actually escaping all those characters. Um, and similarly, you can't put it into a comment unless it's doing that. So anyway, just make sure you know what it's doing. So I wanted to go through a little example here. So there's, um, there's a templating language called uh, EJS, which stands for Embedded JavaScript. And it has this interesting, uh, like simple syntax here, where we just, put, we just use HTML tags. And then anywhere where we have some piece of user data that we want to um, add into our um, page, we can, um, we can use, uh, here, let me see if I can use this remote. We can use, uh, there we go, yeah, cool. So, uh, so yeah, we can use this, this uh, right here, this uh, percent equals syntax. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna take this, this uh, JavaScript value, evaluate it, and whatever it returns, it's going to uh, escape it and then put it into the page there. Uh, and so if we, we do that, we're, we're fine. Uh, and it also supports some other things like, uh, like this if, whatever, this syntax here where you can sort of write arbitrary JavaScript, uh, make your template do different things. Uh, and then you invoke, uh, you, you invoke the template by saying, that's the template I want to render, and this is my data that I want to sort of insert in. Um, cool, so that seems reasonable. Um, uh, React has something similar. So uh, React is, uh, you take, you take some, some uh, HTML string like we have here, like in this case, high, and if we want to put it into the page, then we're, uh, we use this sort of interpolation uh, using uh, an angle bracket there to put it inside of uh, this div. Um, the thing is though, if you try to do this, it's actually gonna escape it. Uh, so uh, React is gonna say, we think that this is untrusted. This could be some random crap from the user. And so we actually want to, uh, we, we don't want to treat that as true HTML. We're gonna escape it. Um, and, uh, and then you might think, well, aha, I know, how, I know how React works. In React, I'm supposed to, uh, I can put whatever JavaScript property I want in, uh, in here as an attribute, and then it's gonna set that as, uh, you know, it's gonna assign inner HTML to this string. Um, and normally that is what, what works, but in order to protect you from yourself, React actually makes this not work. Uh, so what's interesting is both of these sort of obvious ways of like trying to put a, a user string into uh, a div are not gonna like let you do what you, what you think it's gonna do. It's gonna, um, in this case, it's gonna escape it, and in this case, I believe it's an error. Uh, so how do we actually take some string? And if we really, we really know that, that uh, this is safe, uh, in this case, like here, we know this is actually safe. Let's say we wanted to add this to the page. How would we do it? Um, well, in React, they have this uh, attribute called dangerously set inner HTML. Uh, and it's not only enough to just make that, the value be that. You actually have to make the value be an object with an underscore, underscore, so two underscores, so it's extra scary. Uh, HTML uh, property, and then you make the value be, uh, you know, the actual string. And so when it sees this, it's going to say, okay, all right, you must know what you're doing. Um, we're going we're gonna to assume this string here um, is, uh, is safe, and we're not going to run our escaping function on it. We're just going to stick it in the page. It better be safe. Um, you know, in other words, you, the programmer, have better have made it safe already by the time you call this. Uh, uh, so what's nice about this is this looks ugly. Um, that's actually a good thing, <laughs> because if you see this in a code base, you should, you should uh, want to refactor it. <laughs> you should want to be like, ugh, like, how, like, why are you, why are you, you know, if you see your teammate uh, and you're, you're, a code, you're code reviewing this code, you should want to ask them why did they do this instead of something less ugly. Uh, and that's actually, that's, that's nice. That's actually good. That's, 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 that's a feature here. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yeah, so I like this design in, in React. Um, they also have this, this is kind of unrelated, but they have this hilarious uh, other uh, property called uh, secret DOM, do not use or you'll be fired. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, there was actually, there's actually been uh, uh, people opened up po po like issues saying like, why is this property named this? Can we name it something, uh, something sh shorter? Like just do not use. Uh, and they're like, no, we're keeping it this because we really don't want anyone to use this. We want people to be afraid. Uh, and only people who really know what they're doing uh, will maybe feel free to use this. Uh, so this is also a funny thing I, 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 I found uh, as another idea. You can make a function, and if you, you really want users to not use it for some reason, you can actually add like an uh, additional uh, argument 
where they have to pass in a string that's like some terms that they're agreeing to. <laughs> if they don't pass that exact string in, then the function will throw an exception. And so it's very ugly to use, but it's nice because you sort of know that they must have agreed to this, uh, and they must see that you know you, they must see this string at the time that they're calling the function. Anyway, um, this is kind of these are kind of tangents, but the point here is just that um, is that uh, that the, the opt out from the safe behavior should should be sort of uh, difficult, uh, and I think React does a good job with it. But I want to show you um, sort of a bad example where they didn't do a good job of it, and that would be this this EJS. Um, templating language, which I actually I do use, and it's actually quite nice. It's just it it doesn't make it um, it makes it a little bit too easy to do the wrong thing. So let's see how that might happen. So I'm going to make uh, an express server here, and I'm just going to make it listen on port 4000, and we'll just add a really simple route for the home page, and all we're going to do is just send back some HTML. Um, and let's actually define what this HTML is going to be. Uh, so, so the way that this works is, I believe EJS has a render function that takes in a template and then some variables. Um, and so, let's say that we're going to we're going to have a name, and we're just going to try and put put my name into the page. Um, is it, can everyone see this? Is this visible? Okay, I think it is. It's big enough, right? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so now let's make the template. And so this is that, that template sort of syntax that we saw before where um, we're just going to sort of, let's make this page just be an H1 that says hi and then the name of the person. So we use this percent equals name equals, or no, I think it's percent that. Uh, I think that's the syntax. Okay, so that's our, that's our HTML template. And then we're saying render that, but substitute in for us anywhere where name is, uh, is used. And uh, that's going to escape it. So this should be safe. Um, let's go ahead and actually see if that works. So um, here we go. So I'll load up localhost. And it says for us. OK, cool. Uh, and if I change this to, um, uh, let's change this so that it actually, um, Actually, let me, before I move on, let me just make sure we all understand. Like, it just put it just put the the name right there, right? Okay. So now let's let's do something slightly fancier. Let's make it pull the uh, query parameter out uh, so that the name can be specified sort of by the user who's visiting the page. And if we do that, and then we take that name and put that in here. Uh, does everybody know this syntax right here? What I'm doing here is this is just saying. The key is name, and I want the value to be the name variable in this local context that we're in, which is just going to be that. If I want it here, I'll be less fancy. Then we won't have to be confused. OK. So that's what's going on. And so now um, I can be pretty sure that this is safe, uh, I think. So if I uh, refresh this, oh, right, I need to default it to something. If, if, it's, if there's no query parameter set, we'll default it to a named person. OK. So now if I go in here to the URL and I say uh, name equals for us, it works. And if I change that to be name equals script alert hi, we're going to get uh, what we want. Cool. So the only thing that's really worrying about this is if I were to make a mistake in this template and accidentally type a dash instead of an equals, then we have total disaster. We're completely owned. So now this script is actually uh, apparently not running. I don't know. Why is it not running? Oh, haha. -ha. OK. <laughs> um, that's actually something we're going to get to in a second. So let me uh, hold, hold up. I'll just switch to a different, slightly different browser, and then we'll see. OK, so it works. So yeah, so what's going on here is, right, that script is, uh, does everyone see that? It's just in the page, um, and it, it didn't escape it. So, so anyway, the lesson, the lesson here is just that like, I think this, this template language makes, makes this like, way too easy of a mistake to make. Like, if, if, if one of your colleagues submits this in a, in a code review and you just happen to miss this like, single character, then you've just introduced a massive security hole into your, into your website. So it's a bad design. Um, yeah, OK, so, so let's continue. So, so yeah, and then they have all these different confusing prefixes. They all do different things. Um, and then these, these are the two where this is like totally fine, we're all dandy, this is like disaster. So uh, they're way too simple, or too, too similar. 
OK, so, um, okay, so let's, let's continue um, and talk about um, what we can do if we, um, if we just assume that this is going to happen, XSS is going to happen, our site is going to be attacked in this way. Um, we saw like, how, how prevalent this is. Um, so maybe the right, uh, the right strategy is not just to try to uh, be very careful and to avoid it, but also to just assume it's going to happen and then think about ways we can be safe even when it does happen. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. So, um, so uh, remember, the, the, the core problem here is the attacker's code is running in, our, in the same page as uh, this, uh, you know, in the same page as uh, the, the, the page. So this is the page that we wrote all of our code in, and it has user data in it, and it has user cookies and all kinds of private information. So how can we make sure that when the attacker's code is in this page, and it's running amok and doing whatever it wants, that we're somehow still OK? It seems like a tall order almost impossible. But uh, there is a way. Uh, and the concept here is, is called, it's, 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 it's this key idea of, of this class and of, of all computer security, which is uh, the idea of a defense in depth. So this, this term means um, we want to provide redundant security so that even if one measure fails, it will be saved by another one. And so the attacker now has to find multiple vulnerabilities um, and in order to uh, produce a successful attack. We sort of have multiple multiple layers of defense. So, um, does anyone can anyone think of any examples of defense in depth in computer systems that you might have used? Mm -hmm. So I know um, for some cases when you're like downloading files on Windows version of Safari, like it'll say like, do you want to allow like downloading files from this domain? And then depending on the file, you'll have to like right click and click open and then click open again just to run. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's particularly annoying sometimes, but uh, but yeah. So I think the idea there is like um, the idea there is that uh, Safari has a built-in way of detecting when you're visiting a malicious site that they're they're hoping to th sort of throw up there and warn you about like don't proceed. Are you sure you want to proceed? And say that you proceed anyway. Um, even then, like you know, you end up downloading some malicious file. You still have to sort of be relatively a relatively advanced user and know how to right-click open instead of just double-click, which I guess. Uh, if you're so you're such a basic user that you don't know how to right-click open, then pr maybe maybe this is actually protecting you. So I guess that's the idea there. Uh, anyone else have any other ideas? Mm -hmm. Protect yeah, that's a great example. So so even even um, though you've hopefully set a really strong password um, and you know that no one can guess your password, you're still um, using a second factor. You're still saying that even if an attacker were to know my password, it would also have to physically have my phone or my 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 second factor device. Uh, yeah, so that's a great example. Um, and then even in that situation with the password plus two factor, um, there's even a third thing, which is that oftentimes you'll still get, you, you know, you'll get an email from the service saying, uh, we noticed that you logged in uh, from a new location. So even if you lose your, pa you know, someone gets your password and they happen to get your second factor, um, you'll, there'll hopefully be some kind of an audit trail that you'll uh, be able to see and know, you know, uh, that I got hacked and I can sort of respond in some way. And so this is all, this is, this is, this is just, uh, you know, an example of defense in depth. Uh -huh, you know, I have another one? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I've not heard of someone. I mean, no, I, yeah, I think, I think I've not heard of that. Uh, yeah, but that was, that was because DES was insecure, and they were like, well, just do it three times in a row, and then it'll be better. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't, I, I don't know, yeah. I feel like that in that situation, too, it's actually, um, if you encrypt something twice, and then you lose either key, now you're in trouble. So it's actually doubled the risk of, you get uh, of you losing access to your data, um, but maybe if you gave those keys to different people or something, um, it might work. But anyway, I think we're sort of stretching the metaphor at this point. So, so I'll, I'll move on. But um, but this is this is defense in depth. Any, anyone have any questions about it? Okay, cool. So uh, so let's talk about a way to do defense in depth. Uh, specifically, we want to defend the user's cookies. So we know that uh, the attacker is running their code in our user's browser. And they're trying to steal that user's cookies. If they, if they succeed, they're going to be able to take the cookies and log in as that user from their own attacker computer. You know. OK, so we talked about a way to defend against this with uh, HTTP-only cookies. Um, and remember, the way this worked was that uh, even, uh, so even if the attacker is running JavaScript in the page, they can't access this, uh, this value. So when they, when they, uh, when they call document.cookie, uh, it will be as if this cookie was not in the browser. Uh, so, so hopefully that's familiar. 
Uh, and specifically, like this attack that I've been showing over and over again, where you, where you just exfiltrate a cookie using an image, uh, this would not work because document.cookie would not return this key value pair. Does that make sense? Cool. So, uh, so then, uh, and then just just quick quick review. So, how how do you? So, why would we do this? So, I mean, or how would the how would this value actually end up being used if it's HTTP only? Why would we even bother? Like, how is how do we actually get to use this this cookie now? It's included as a header, exactly. So, whenever we make API, like if we if we make an HTTP request to some endpoint on our server, like slash API slash something, uh, that cookie will be added automatically, and so our server will be able to see it exactly. Cool. Okay, so this is a really fun uh, thing that I didn't have time to get to last time. This is really cool. So, uh, so there's this uh, uh, feature that. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Before I go, yeah, you have a question. Sorry, so previous sure. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. That's totally right. Yep, okay. you're right. So this is not like this by itself. It, you know, if you do this and you think, oh, like I'm safe against XSS now. Like the eh, attackers run your code in my site. You're still going to have trouble. Like so. So the idea here is just we we sort of mitigated one potential thing that they could do. Um, but uh, ultimately, if they can run scripts on your website, so problem. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. If they can run scripts on your site, then they could do all kinds of things. They could change the page. They could delete your account. You know, they could do whatever they want to the user. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're going to combine this with a bunch of other things, and then together they sort of collectively make a really nice set of of layers of defenses. Yeah. But that's a, that's a really good point. You're right. This does not uh, does not fully protect you. Okay. So here's here's a really cool idea. So. So Chrome was like, okay, so reflect. So XSS is a huge problem. Uh, everybody keeps making XSS uh, vulnerabilities in their websites, and almost everyone's vulnerable. So what if we could just help everybody out? Like, just make make it go away. Uh, so they had this awesome idea, which was, uh, what, how about this? When when we load a page and we're parsing the HTML for that uh, that page, if we notice that there's uh, something in the URL that matches something in the page. Then maybe that was a reflected XSS, right? Maybe the server was was tricked and would actually put it it reflected out something that it got in as input out into the output. And so what if what if we, what if we see that we should just maybe just block it, just like don't let that script run. And now we've we, now we've protected uh, the website, even though the website's insecure. Like our browser, the browser is smart enough to effectively uh, refuse to run that that attacker code, right? Seems like a good idea, right? Uh, I mean. It's. Can anyone think of what might be bad about this? Like, I can't. I mean, a, a first, uh, a first look at it seems like it's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, you can make. Uh, I guess you can include stuff in the query that it then parses to. It, it'll think that it's like bad code, but instead of like friendly code, it create, it just kills it from the server code, and you just kill the friendly code. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. So that's right. Um, yeah. So so uh, so well, yeah. Let's let's go into it. So um, well, first first of all, before we go into that, I just want to mention it also had a bunch of false negatives too. So it was possible to get past the filter quite easily. One thing you could do is you could uh, change the query slightly uh, and encode it in different ways, and then if it got echoed out, Chrome wouldn't be smart enough to tell that 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 input was the same as that output, um, uh, and uh, but this is the bigger, much bigger problem is the false positive problem that, that you mentioned. So in particular, there's no way to know whether a given script block, uh, which appears in both the request and the response, was actually truly reflected, or if uh, somebody just added it into the into the request to make it look like it was a reflected XSS attack. So let's make that concrete. So say we have a page, and the page has a script alert high in it, and this page, and say that this is supposed to be there, like this is code that the site author included. So they're happy to have this code run. Uh, now, uh, if the user visits this page, then the XSS auditor is not going to—it's uh, not going to do anything. It's going to—you know—it's going to think that everything's fine. It's going to run the script, no problem. But but if the user visits the page and they attach this query string here, query equals that script uh, that that appears in the page, and the auditor is going to think that that was reflected into the page, right? And so it's going to conclude it's an attack, and then therefore it's going to sort of neuter the script and make it not run. Okay, hopefully we're starting to get some ideas, things we could do with this. So I'm going to show a demo of this. So let's go to our uh, our our bank site that we've been building, 
And let's just add a little script here into the page. Um, OK, so I don't want to type this, so I'm just going to steal it from something I already wrote. <laughs> uh, OK, so what we're doing here is I'm just, uh, I'm just including that frame busting code that I mentioned before. And we, we, we have better ways to defend against being framed. Remember, we have an HTTP header that we should use instead. But, but just to make this, uh, this demo, uh, we're going to use this method of sort of detecting that, we're, uh, that this page is in a frame. And so the idea here is the bank doesn't want anyone to put it in a frame. Um, and it's going to use this JavaScript to ensure that if it detects that it's in a frame, it's going to set the whole browser's location to the bank site. And so that frame will sort of bust out and take over the whole, the whole page. And so that way, the bank has sort of prevented itself from being framed. Um, hopefully, that's uh, familiar. So we're, we're going to add that script to both pages if the user is logged in and if they're not logged in. OK, great. Now, I'm going to go to um, a file that's going to represent our attacker. And our attacker is going to try and include a uh, frame now to this bank. And the bank, I think, is called target on port 4000. And I think, so this should fail, because the attacker is framing the bank, and the bank just wrote that script. So let's, let's see if that's true. So if I go to my browser, uh, and I load uh, tar target 4000. Oh, wait, oh, sorry, I'm running, the, I'm running two servers. I need to switch to running different server. OK, there we go. So here's our bank. Perfect. And let me just confirm that the script appears in there now. Excellent. So now we'll go to our attackers page. And OK, so notice what just happened. I visited the attackers page, and it, the whole browser redirected to the bank. So that means that the, the frame busting worked. Uh, let me just confirm that that's true. If I open up the inspector here, let me look at the requests. We can see uh, if I visit attacker.com, uh, let me just clear this really quick and do that one more time. OK, there we go. So what happened was we loaded the, atta the attackers HTML here, which was uh, uh, I guess I can't see it very easily, but the point is that we yeah we loaded up the attacker's page and then we were uh, sort of forcefully redirected to the bank uh, site because that script ran. Okay, so now let's see if there's a way we can we can uh, cause that script on the bank to not execute. So let's just uh, let's let's test this out by by directly uh, playing with the URL here on the bank site. So I'm going to uh, let's see I'm going to let's view the source and let's just copy this script. Because this is the script we want to prevent from running. So if I copy it, and I just put it into a query parameter here, query equals that script. Uh, now, uh, it looks like nothing's different. But, uh, but if I view source, this is in red now. So this is Chrome saying, it looks like you have an XSS in your site. And we're going to protect you by uh, making this script not run. OK, so now if the attacker just copies that URL and puts that into the, into the frame here, and then uh, now we load up the attacker page. Uh, I think the only issue is it's cached, so I need to, I need to visit that while, the, while, that, while my inspector is open. But there we go. So now, um, now the bank frame is there, and the attacker is allowed to, allowed to frame it. Um, so we, we've sort of neutered that, that script that was, that was a little bit inconvenient for us as an attacker. Um, it seems like a, a problem. <laughs> we can sort of snipe out particular scripts that bother us from sites that we're trying to attack. Uh, not good. Any questions about this? Yeah. yeah. What's the advantage of like just doing that step before it gets to a server and comes back with like JavaScript in the DOM? Like, can you just like look at the query and be like, this is stupid? Oh, could the server just look at the query and say, that looks like? Oh, should, could the browser prevent you from making a request that looks malicious? Yeah, yeah just like query, like question mark, equals script, whatever. Oh, yeah. The browser can just be like, pop up, like, you're stupid. <laughs> so uh, that would work. I think that would break some legitimate sites. So some sites are actually coded in a way where they pass HTML from one page to the other through the query uh, string. And it's a bad idea, but. Uh, I guess you could do that safely, right? If you're actually filtering the tags, and you're, but you expect that to work, uh, and and your suggestion would break that. Like if I do that, then doesn't this solution like break that in case anyways? Because then it breaks, then it deletes the script. And That's true. Actually, you're right. Uh, and how do how does that how is that use case supported then? Huh. 
I think that this is fine if it's not, um, if it's not dynamic content like scripts and stuff. Um, but yeah, that is, that is true. Yeah, I'm not sure. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, let's, let's move on. So, um, but any other questions? Okay, so 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 uh, so anyway, they, you know, they realized this was a bad idea. So after uh, after like I think six years of this being deployed, um, and and you know, a ton of bypasses being found, um, the sort of uh, policy that they came up with was, well, you know, we don't think bypasses are that bad. This still protects this protects uh, people some of the time. It catches some attacks. Let's keep it there. Um, uh, and um, so they didn't consider you know being being, being able to bypass it as, as significant. However, um, when people people started pointing out, well, you could sort of snipe out scripts that you don't like from sites you're trying to attack, then they took that more seriously and they switched the default behavior to be that I think uh, instead of it just removing a script from the page, it would entirely block uh, the page from loading. But anyway, now 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 the current policy is uh, is that uh, they're, they're just deleting all this. This is just they just considered it's a bad idea. Clu concluded it's a bad idea. So actually, if I switch over here to to, uh, to Chrome Canary, which is the, you know, the latest version of Chrome uh, that is sort of in beta right now. And if I visit that uh, page, uh, what do we get here? Oh, gosh. This is, oh, wow. That is hilarious. So, 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 it, so OK, so two things just happened here that I have to point out. This is, this is actually, I did not expect this, but it's very interesting. So let me first, uh, let me first copy the, the target uh, URL here that, that has the attack in it. And I'm just going to go over here now to, to the beta Chrome. And I'm just going to show you that. Uh, that it doesn't try to block it doesn't try to block it out. Uh, so if I oh, wait, well, give me one second. Why is it uh, why is it being escaped? I thought that it was supposed to be an attack. Uh, oh right right right. I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm okay. Here, two things are going on here. Yeah, so the point is that the script is in the page, and you notice that it's not red. Uh, it's not red even even when I put um, when I put the script into the URL. So. Yeah. So the point is that, that they're not they're no longer filtering this out. Uh, that that the, the, the auditor has been removed from from Canary. But what we saw happen uh, was that redirect block thing is actually another security feature that just actually kind of got me in trouble here. Because uh, what I wanted to happen was I wanted this bank site to I wanted the frame busting code to run and the bank site to take over the page. But uh, Chrome has a feature that prevents iframes now from from redirecting you. Uh, <laughs> Which just interfered with what we were trying to do, which is really annoying. Uh, so the, the reason they do, they do this is because uh, there's a, there's a phenomenon on the web now where ads will actually, um, in, in addition to just like sort of showing you an ad, they'll try to just like take take you elsewhere. And so uh, like sketchy ad networks will just navigate you elsewhere, and uh, and this prevents that. Uh, and I think the reason why they decided this is an acceptable trade-off, even though it just broke my defense here, is because we have a better way to actually do this defense, which is an HTTP header that says I don't want to be framed, and that's what we should have done. So if we had done that, then, then we, we would still be fine here. Uh, but wow, all these different interacting things. I mean, this is an example of, uh, of why security is hard. OK, okay uh, let's move on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the XSS auditor. Um, it lets us snipe code out of the page. And uh, in about seven days, all your Chromes are going to auto-update to remove it. <laughs> you can do this now. You can, you can snipe. Yeah, you can, you can, you can attack sites by s sniping code out like this for seven more days. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually glad that I was able to show you before my Chrome auto-updated and made it uh, really hard for me to, to demo it. Yeah, so, and then just uh, one other uh, point is just you can do this for, you know, more than just inline scripts, but even if, if there's like, let's say, a bunch of security code in some particular file, you can also snipe that out. Um, you know, if this code is assuming that this, this has loaded, um, you would just, uh, you know, include basically this piece here, and then that, that script just doesn't load. Um, yeah, so it's a problem. Okay, and then one other thing I want to show that this is actually, uh, okay, before I show it, let me just give the context. So, uh, there's a whole other attack here as well, as uh, in addition to disabling scripts you don't like. So if you, uh, so what is going on here? We have we have this way of basically if, if we if we put something in the URL that appears in the page, then uh, Chrome will will you know uh, sort of interfere with that will will block the page from loading, right? So if we if we use this, we can actually detect when things are like particular strings are in the page, right? So, so if I if I uh, if I want to say, um, 
steal some, some variable that's, that's a session token or something that's in your page. I can sort of include a prefix that tries to match that. And if it matches, the whole page will be blocked. And if I can detect that, then I just now I just discovered that that string is in your page, right? Are people, are people following this? I see some confused faces. Uh, let me let me try to explain it one more time. So, so what what did what did we what did we show? We showed that basically if the what's going on here is if this string is in the page, then this then this page uh, uh, you know it's loaded differently, and in particular uh, it, it's actually blocked. The entire page is is blocked from loading. Um, uh, Actually, well, the site can opt into being to fully blocking it, or, or I think the default is that it snipes it out, like I said before. But, but let's say that let's say the whole page gets blocked, right? Um, so now I can sort of by by setting this uh, this string very carefully, I can I can test for the presence of particular uh, 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 particular strings in the page. Yeah. Uh, it's no, it's because the auditor is saying we think a reflected XSS is happening, and so um, if the site has said via a header that it prefers when uh, XSS is detected that the whole page is blocked, then my attack site now can sort of put a string in here and then uh, watch to see whether this iframe uh, fires an on error event, and if there's an on error event, then I know this string must be in the page, and I'm not supposed to be able to tell that because of the same origin policy. But I'm able to sort of trick this, trick the browser into revealing that fact to me. And so if I try a bunch of things, I can actually learn um, a lot of stuff. Like in a simple example, I could I could sort of maybe include the a username and just see if that that appears in the page, and then I know that that's the user who's who's on my site. Uh, but but more more maliciously, you could actually uh, iterate through like a token that appears in the page and try to steal it out of the page. And I actually have a video of that here, which is a wild video. So so. This is, there, this is a page that includes a secret token in the page. And this is an outer page, which is uh, iterating through uh, adding things to the query, basically. And every time it finds a match for a prefix, then Chrome blocks it from loading, and then the page learns that that is, uh, that is in the page. And it's, it's just like in, those, in, the, in the movies where you see that it's breaking the password one character at a time. It's just like that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so this page is going to learn the full uh, the full token there. Yeah, anyway, so, so this is a bad idea. This XSS auditor is quite a bad idea. So let's talk about a different way of, um, of uh, actually protecting our sites, especially since that uh, the XSS auditor is going away. Uh, so so uh, we mentioned last time, uh, or uh, two, two, days, two times ago, that um, we have certain ways of tightening up the same origin policy to sort of prevent other sites from posting forms to us or loading images or scripts or styles from our site. And that was a way of sort of defending our site. Um, this uh, thing called CSP is sort of the inverse of that. So this is a way where we can actually prevent our site from making requests to other sites. And you might think, well, whoa, why would we want to do that? That seems weird. Well, remember, we're, we're trying to defend against an attacker's code running in our page. We want, them, we want to limit what they can do. So if we assume the attacker has JavaScript running on our site in one of our users' browsers, it would be great if we could say, you know what? That code is not allowed to talk to any server except for like my server. And now they can't sort of exfiltrate any data, right? I've sort of sandboxed them in. So, uh, so this is an added layer of security against cross-site scripting. So obviously we don't want attacker code to be running in our sites, but if it is, wouldn't it be great if we could just say, like, Sorry, you can't talk to all these different servers. You can only talk to this particular whitelist of like maybe three servers that I trust. And now the attacker is very limited. They can't actually steal any information except they can talk to those three servers. And if you control those three servers or whatever, then they can't do anything, right? That's the idea. So we need a way to actually specify this policy in a way that the JavaScript can't interfere with it, obviously, because we've just we just said the attacker has code running in the page. So what are we going to do to set this? We're going to use an HTTP header. So with an HTTP header, this is coming directly from the server when it provides the HTML, and it's saying, uh, this is a policy that I want you to enforce for all the code running in this page. And so now, even if the attacker's code is in that page, it's too late for the attacker to do anything to change this policy, because this policy was included in the HTTP header that the server sent back. Right? Does that make sense? 
So yeah, basically we add this header and then the CSP will go ahead and block any requests that violate the policy. So maybe it would help if we look at a few examples, I think. Um, so here's a really simple policy. If you add this header to your, uh, your server's responses, then you're basically saying, I want, you, I want, to the, I want the, uh, the page to only be able to talk to uh, the same origin. So now if, if an attacker happens to stick a script tag in there, they can't talk to any other servers. There's very limited, you know, in terms of what they can do. Um, although your uh, your point, I forgot, what was your name? Yachin. Sorry? Yachin. Yachin. So your point was that uh, that they could still make requests to the same site, and that's that's tr still true in this context as well. Um, th their code could 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 do things on behalf of the user, but they, they can't steal any data now in any way because we've we've sort of prevented requests from going out to any other sites. Um, does this make sense? This is the simplest policy, so hopefully this makes sense. If not, ask questions now, because we're going to add a lot of complexity in a second. OK, so say now we want to, um, oh yeah, let's, let's test our uh, understanding really quick. So would this be allowed? So if this HTML appeared in a page where that was the header that was sent back on that page, would, we, would this be allowed? Yeah, it would be, right? Because this is just loading a JavaScript file from the same site, right? OK, so relative URLs will load this file from the same origin, so we're fine. Um, would this be allowed? Obviously not. It's a different site, right? Different origin. OK, what about this? Unclear, right? Well, remember, we're trying to defend against cross-site scripting here. So it seems like if we let the attacker just write code in line, that we're not really that safe. I mean, most of the attacks we've been showing have been us just calling alert on the cookie, you know, or writing code directly in line. And so it's actually not very much of a defense to tell the attacker, you can't load scripts from your attack server, but you can write whatever code you want. Right, that's not a very, that's not a very good defense. So actually, this policy will by default prevent all inline scripts from running. And so you need to be sure when you do this that you're not um, sort of breaking your own website. You need to make sure basically all your code now appears in hello.js or something like that, external, an external file. But this is really powerful because now we're basically saying like you can't, the attacker can't stick code on our page and they can't load code from their site. So all that they can do is hopefully, they could hope to have some way of maybe affecting this file, but, but, uh, but, 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 uh, but that's a whole other kind of an attack. That's not cross-site scripting. And so this actually sort of seems like it defeats cross-site scripting. Right? Yeah? So this is, this is not really a question, more of a conversation, but it seems like this is another reason that uh, having different files on your server is much better than putting everything in one. It's not just a stylistic thing. Mm. It affects the security. Yeah, I mean, in this situation, you're right, yeah. Yeah, because we're sticking a bunch of user data into the page, and now we know that uh, uh, we know that if it happens to be a script, it's not going to run. Yeah, that's totally right. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. And then um, one other example here. So what about if there's code inside of an attribute, uh, like an event handler like that, like on mouse over? Should that be allowed? For the same reason as this was denied, I think we also want to deny this, right? Because if, if the attacker happens to get something in there, now they're, now they're running code again. So, so, so we want to block that as well. So yeah, that one line right there just sort of completely, it seems like it completely saved us from cross-site scripting. That's great. So um, cool. So, so now what if we want to change the policy slightly, relax it a little bit. Say that we trust trusted.com and we want to let them load. Uh, we want to load scripts from, from uh, subdomains of trusted.com. Well, we can just add trusted.com there to the list of, uh, of uh, sites that we trust. So that's pretty simple. Pretty simple. Um, let's go through an example now where, say, we, say we're a webmail provider um, and we're trying to uh, just load the scripts from our same origin and then maybe subdomains of our site. Uh, and then we also want to allow images to be loaded from anywhere because images can't really do very much. Uh, so let's say we're okay with images coming from any, any location. When we write, a, we write a policy like this. So yeah, not too bad. Um, so here's a question. Say that an attacker manages to get a script in this page, uh, although I guess they can't because of what we, we said about this would defend, this would, this line here would block the script from running, right? Um, yeah, I think this is actually a silly question. Let me, 
me skip it. OK. So um, what I want to mention now is deploying CSP. So if, say that you, you think that this, is, this header is a good idea and you want to add it to your site. One problem you'll have is that uh, you might think like, OK, I know that I'm loading images from here and here and here, and I'm loading a couple of scripts from here, and you know, these, these domains. And if you miss one, though, and then you deploy a policy, you've actually just broken your site for all your users because you've told the browser, don't let these resources be loaded. Uh, and so that's really bad. And so we have a way of uh, deploying a CSP in report-only mode. So you put the policy here, and you just say, look, if, if there's a violation, uh, it's fine. Um, let the code run. But please send a little request to uh, a URL somewhere where I will be notified, and I can look at those reports, and I can see what exactly would have failed in production, and I can adjust the policy before uh, I'm, I'm, you know, before I actually deploy it for real, and I remove the report only part. So this is a way to sort of test it out, and this is important if you're deploying it on an existing site that's really complicated. Um, cool. And then there's one other thing, which is on an, on a so then when you actually do deploy it, um, maybe you still are a little bit paranoid that uh, that you might have made some mistakes. You can also include a report URL, which will uh, get uh, pinged anytime anything is blocked. And so you can watch those reports and see, like, OK, uh, I guess I forgot that one edge case there. You know, and uh, you, can, you can update it. Other thing that's kind of cool about this is if an attacker is playing around with your, um, with your site and trying to find attacks, every time the CSP blocks it, you'll get pings. And you'll be able to see like, attacks happening in real time against your site. Well, not real attacks, but an, an attacker playing around with parameters in your, in your URLs. Cool, so there's a whole bunch of these directives. So we, I, I showed default source earlier, but there's like a whole bunch of different ones. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but just point out a few. So, um, so we talked about images already too. We could sort of say we wanna load images from, from these particular locations. Um, uh, object is a really uh, uh, interesting one because it's, it's all this sort of old Flash and Java applets and things that can be embedded in pages. If you're not using that stuff on your site, just block this entirely um, and then Scripts are, scripts are probably, this is probably the most important one to set a policy on, because this is really what, what we're trying to do here is prevent cross-site scripting. So you should be very careful about how you set the script source. Um, cool. And then there's a few other ones, um, which these are, these are interesting because, uh, so, so uh, if you look at the old list here, if you don't set a policy for any of these, then it inherits from default source. So you can just set a default source to be like my own, you know, just same origin, and then you don't have to set any of this other stuff. Uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and so you can sort of just uh, change a few that you need to change separately from default source. But then um, these ones don't inherit from default source, so you actually have to set these separately if you, if you care about them. And there's some interesting ones in here. So um, this one is kind of interesting. So, so there's this tag called base in HTML, and if you include it in a page, then all the relative URLs in the site become relative to whatever is specified in base. So I could, if, if an attacker can put, can put a base tag on your site, then they can say like base is attacker.com, then any of your code that is, that is p sending a request to like slash uh, API, whatever, or slash uh, any endpoint basically that is, relative, that is relatively specified will just have the attacker.com prepended to it and the data will go there instead. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is, a, this is a tag that you probably want to have a policy about uh, and in particular you could just prevent it. It's, there's not really a good reason to to use it. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. And then uh, this one's also interesting. So Frame Ancestors lets you say, I don't want to be framed. And um, I mentioned before there was already another tag for that. So this is a sort of duplicated way of doing it. This is the newer way of doing it. Um, yeah. Um, oh, and then this one's also quite interesting, Upgrade and Secure Requests. So this is useful if you have a site that is, uh, again, an old site, and you're trying to migrate it to be more secure, you want to have all of the requests that happen to point to HTTP URLs be magically upgraded to HTTPS. You can sort of apply that as a policy to the whole page, um, and that will, the browser will do that for you. But yeah, these are pretty different from, X, you know, in general, these seem pretty different than XSS, but they're, uh, they're part of content security policy. <sighs> okay. Any questions? All right. Okay, so. Let's talk about actually deploying it. So here's a script that appeared in one of my websites. And so when I was going to deploy CSP, I was like, OK, OK, so I clearly I need to load something from Google Analytics, because I want to track how many visitors are coming to my site. So I said, OK, let's allow scripts from Google Analytics and also from my own 
uh, my own site, obviously. Uh, and uh, for everything else, let's just, just default to, um, to only allowing it from my own site. So images, videos, everything else will just be only allowed from my, from my own site. So this seems pretty safe, right? Like code can only run from Google Analytics or from my, from my site. I like that, right? Seems good. So what's the problem? Well, we mentioned before that uh, actually somebody tell me, somebody tell me what the problem is. You should know this. Said it earlier. What's the problem? Inline code, yeah. That script tag up there is inline code. So this policy is going to deny that. It's going to say that could be attacker code. It's inline. You should put that in a separate file. Well, that's kind of annoying. Um, in this case, I could put it in a separate file. No big deal. Uh, but, uh, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have some kind of like ad code or something that you're putting on your site, and it has to be in a specific format. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, you know, this policy is going to block these inline scripts, uh, which, uh, uh, which, which is um, going to prevent my, my, my Google Analytics from working. But there's this thing I can add called unsafe inline. And that basically says, let inline scripts be OK. Like, don't block those. Uh, the problem with that is it's basically equivalent to having no content security policy at all. Because now we're back to the situation where the attacker can, can put whatever they want in. Um, but, uh, but that would solve the problem. A better solution would be to move the code into another file, host that on our own site. Uh, but let, for now, let's just throw this in here because I don't want to change the HTML code. So that's a bad idea, but I'm going I'm to put it in there anyway. OK. So there's still another problem. This CSP here is too restrictive. It's going to break our site. What's the problem? Seems fine. Yeah? Yeah, that's right. So when the Google Analytics script runs and it, 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 the JavaScript executes, and now it wants to sort of save information about what the user did on our site. Like in particular, this thing right here, send page view, this is going to actually ping a URL using an image, like I showed the, the code I showed before, where you do new image dot source equals whatever. And when it does that, uh, it's going to basically be attempting to load an image. And our policy says images can only be loaded from our own origin. And so we just broke Google Analytics. So we actually have to, yeah, so this is the code they're running internally. They're running, uh, they're making an image that points to Google Analytics slash whatever collect equals some data that they're collecting, right? So we need to now say, OK, fine, you can load images from Google Analytics. <laughs> OK. Uh, this, this works, but it seems like this is kind of fragile. Like we're sort of now making our policy sort of dependent upon what the code in here is going to do. And if Google decides to change what this script does or what domain it talks to, then we've broken it. Uh, so it's, it's actually not a good, it's, it's not ideal. Um, and, and so, uh, so yeah, uh, we should, we could say, you know what, let's just make the image be anywhere because images are pretty harmless. Uh, and so now I guess that's a little bit better if they, if they change the, the location that they're talking to, we'll still allow it. But, but we still have the same problem. Like, in particular, there's, there's, there's a thing that they actually, uh, th that scripts often do, which is this script might include another script to load some more functionality. And then that script could come from a different page. And now we've broken Google Analytics. So this is code that actually like, used to appear inside of this script. Um, it would make a script, point it to ssl.googleanalytics.com, and then uh, add that to the page. And that would get blocked. And so you'd have to add that as well. Um, and so this is just, it's really hard to get right, basically, because it's based on this sort of runtime behavior of what is the script going to do? I better make sure I've, I allowed that in advance, or else I just broke my site. And so for this reason, people have actually been very hesitant to deploy this, even though it's such a good defense against cross-site scripting. It's just so fragile. You might break your site, and people prefer to not have broken sites. Uh, and so it's, it's just been a very hard thing to roll out. Uh, and so we need a way to basically ensure that our CSP never breaks our site, even when new scripts are added. Um, and so here's an idea. What if we propagate trust from the initial script, which we trust, to any scripts that it includes at runtime, which we now want to implicitly trust. And we do that no matter where that script comes from. That seems like it would work, right? So we're basically saying, we trust Google Analytics. Uh, they, could put it, they could put whatever code they want in there that might be malicious. We, already, we're, we know they're not going to do that. We trust them. So, so why, don't we, why don't we just also trust them to load code from wherever they want? Because we already trust them. It doesn't seem too bad to just trust them to load code from, from any place they want, right? So that's the idea. Questions about this? Cool, yeah. OK, so, so there's this paper that uh, uh, some, some Google people wrote called CSP is Dead, Long Live CSP. Uh, and it talks about how 
they, they basically analyzed all these uh, sites that have deployed this to protect themselves, and they discovered like extremely damning results. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I have some quotes here. So 14 out of the 15 domains most commonly whitelisted for loading scripts contain unsafe endpoints. And as a consequence, 75% of distinct policies use script whitelists that to allow attackers to bypass CSP. So this is just saying they trust domains where uh, effectively an attacker can upload code. Like they can put whatever they want there. So you said, I trust that domain, but anyone can put stuff on that domain. And so what, what did you actually, what well, you didn't accomplish anything by saying that you, you know, by, by adding that policy. Another, another thing, so here, 94% of policies that attempt to limit script execution are ineffective. And 99% of hosts with CSP use policies that offer no benefit against cross-site scripting. That's like, why are we even trying here? Like this is just so bad, right? Okay, so, so, uh, so the good news though is in the end of the paper, they proposed a solution. Uh, and that solution has been deployed and it actually works great. So, so there's, a, there's a, the silver lining here. Okay, let's first talk about the things they mentioned in the paper that allow bypassing the, con the, the, the CSP policies. So here's an example. Um, I kind of mentioned this before with the JSONP. Um, remember where this is an, a an endpoint where it's going to return us um, it's going to return us some data, but we, we a we're asking that server, please wrap the data in a function named this. But in this case, if an attacker can put some code in here and then they can make they can make that return sort of anything they want. Now it's really bad if we trust this this server now because we're saying we trust any code that comes from this server. But if an attacker can get this script in the page, they can make that server run whatever code they put in the parameters here. And so we got no defense from that. Does that make sense? So, so I, I guess I should have included a, a, an actual domain in the, in the URL there. Um, but what's going on here is we're saying we trust this site to only return us, uh, we, we trust this site to return us like safe code and we're gonna allow that code to run. But it's possible for an attacker to create a URL that makes that site return whatever code the attacker wants. And so it's a really bad idea for us to trust a site that has such, a, such an endpoint on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're not directly like attacking the site. They're just has this site happens to have a URL that if you go to it, it will echo out whatever the attacker gives it. Uh, and if that if so if, if if it can get it to echo out valid JavaScript, then now the attacker can basically put what it's effectively like they're putting whatever code they want on that site. But it's actually just echoed in this case, but it's, it has the same effect. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's show another example here. So um, this is an example using uh, AngularJS. So it's typical in AngularJS to include the library and then to include uh, t template code. And then the, the, co the JavaScript up here will actually look through the page and find code that matches uh, uh, template. And then it will run the JavaScript that's in the braces here. And so um, if you have Angular on your page uh, and you think that your CSP is protecting you from arbitrary code execution. The thing is, so you, you, you as a site cr creator, you've said, I trust Angular. Like I know Angular is not malware, so I'm gonna trust allowed.com to, you know, to load Angular from there. The problem is that if an attacker can make divs in your page, like which presumably they might be able to do because divs are not code, so you might let the attacker control some divs and you let them put braces in the divs. Well, Angular is gonna go come along later and see these braces and think, ah, I should execute that. Right, and so uh, you know now you're now giving the attacker again arbitrary JavaScript uh, execution on your site. So to ta attack this, you would put some actual malicious code inside of the braces. So it's just things to think about, right? Like, even if you trust Angular, like, what is it doing, and how can the attacker control things that would affect its behavior? Okay, um, and then here's another one. This is a this is a really wild one. So. Say that you have an endpoint on your server which returns, um, uh, returns an error. It says error colon, and then in this case, this is supposed to be like a URL and then not found, like it's a 404 page. What we could do is we could try to visit slash alert document cookie blah, 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 and the page is going to say, you know, th th this, the site's going to say, wait a minute, that's not a URL. So it'll say error. It'll say that's the URL you tried to visit is not found. And my question is, is this valid JavaScript? 
It actually is. So this syntax here is, uh, is a way to name uh, a line of code, and then you can use a go to to sort of jump to that line of code, basically. It's not literally go to, but it's effectively like a go to. And so we've named this part of our code error, and then this is the code we're going to run, and then we, we sort of commented out the rest of the page. Uh, and so again, if we trust this site, but it has this 404 page implementation, then we're in trouble. Because now we attacker can basically put whatever code they want onto that site. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. The 404. Huh. I wonder if you, four, if you return a 404 from a script and then, but it's valid JavaScript, would it execute? I actually don't know. I don't know. So maybe that, yeah, maybe that would prevent this. Um, this is definitely getting into sort of esoteric territory for sure. But, um, you know, my guess is it would, it would actually execute it. That would be my guess. But I, I, I don't know. Um, OK, and there's even more wild attacks. Like, say the attacker can control some data inside of a CSV file. Um, this, again, might be possibly valid JavaScript. Like, if name is a variable and then value is a variable, this will just echo name and value and then run this code. Um, really quite esoteric. But uh, anyway, the point is, the point is, that, um, is that CSPs are hard to get right. Uh, uh, and so there's this site called uselesscsp.com, which uh, collects examples of people who failed to do CSP correctly. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you go there, it's actually, there's a whole bunch of, of, uh, of big companies on there. Like I think the top result right now is Apple is on there and Apple's CSP is completely ineffective. Um, um, yeah. And I think right now their, 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 their SSL certificate is expired. So if you try to go there, they're also a failure in, <laughs> in some ways. So if you, if you just ignore that, you can actually see the site uh, security. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so anyway, uh, so basically, uh, the solution to this is what was proposed in the paper. And it's a really great solution, and this is what you should use. And um, it solves sort of all the problems that we've talked about. So it's called strict dynamic. And the basic idea is, instead of specifying in uh, the policy for scripts that all the list of domains that you know uh, might ever be contacted uh, by code that you trust, you can just say, look, uh, I'm just going to tr implicitly trust certain ones and then let those load anything they want and just sort of cascade the trust onwards to anything that they may want to load. Um, and so that's great. So now we're going to load some code from trusted.com in this example. But how do we know that we can trust this script? How do we know this script is not attacker injected code? Well, the, serv the, the HTTP header here included a nonce. In this example, it was ABC123. So this is just going to be a random value that the server chooses. And then uh, what it's saying here is it's telling the browser, look, any script that you see in the page must include nonce equals that value, ABC123. If it doesn't include that as an attribute, then it means that it was attacker injected. And so in both of these examples here, this, these, both, of these, both, of this code, both of these scripts will be allowed to run. Even the inline one here is fine. And the reason is that we're saying we trust any script that has the nonce on it. And so uh, that has a nonce on it, so it's allowed to run. OK. So, uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're interested, but so you declared the nonce in your setting for PHP? Yes, this is in the HTTP header. And you declare the nonce value. You declare the nonce as value, as ABC123 in this example. And then you have to, then all the HTML, uh, all the scripts in the HTML have to have the same value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, uh, so it's really important uh, that, uh, okay, what was I doing here? Oh, right, yeah, okay, so here's, here's, an example where, uh, here's an example where the attacker tried to inject these last two scripts here. So they tried to add evil.js, uh, and they tried to include some attack code. Now, these two scripts are not going to run, and then your question was, like, how, how come the attacker can't figure out what this nonce is, right? Uh, who knows why? Like, who can, th who can think of why it might be hard for the attacker to figure this out? Yeah, that's so. Can you expand on that? Um, well, presumably, like the attacker would need to like use it in order to get the nonce in the, the site, right? So, like, attacker got caught because they have the same origin. Yeah. Like, that's the nonce. Exactly. So, the the idea is that the that that initially the server sent back a page, right? And that page included includes this nonce sort of in the header and also in 
the, the, the page. Now, how can an attacker possibly see that value? Um, they can't look at the headers of a page, you know, of a response that came back from a server, and they also can't uh, look at a nonce that's in an HTML page of another origin. They just can't. It's a different origin. Now, you might th think, well, couldn't they r run code that looks at the nonce? Like, couldn't they look at the nonce attribute in the page? But the thing is, then you're, uh, you're assuming then that they're already running code in the page. So if, if they're already running code in this page and they can look at the nonce value, then you've already lost because they're already running code in this page. So if they're not yet running code in the page, now they have to find some way to figure out what that nonce is. And what we're doing is we're making sure the server picks a different nonce every time it, it sends back a page. So this is a completely random and unpredictable value. Uh, and so because it's completely unpredictable, the attacker can't just know sort of a priori, like the nonce is going to be this. So when I include this in my like URL for my attack, uh, they, they, can't, they can't know what the nonce is going to be. Yeah? Yeah, for so HTML responses would definitely not you definitely not want them to be cached uh, if you're using uh, CSP like this. Yeah, but the good thing is usually HTML isn't usually HTML isn't cached anyway because you have like uh, like personalized information for the user like when they're logged in you show their name and the header and stuff like that and so usually you don't cache that anyway. But mm -hmm. oh, it's just a it's just a uh, kind of a crypto term for like a random value, random string basically. So it's protecting the web page because the server is selecting it, uh, 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 and it's completely random. And then, it, and then when the browser gets the, gets the HTML for the page, it's going to look at this header and say, OK, I'm being told by the server, don't trust any scripts that don't include that nonce as an attribute. Yeah. And so if the attacker manages to say, do, let's say they do a stored XSS, they get, they get this script right here, evil.js, this one, they get it into the database somehow. Well, when it gets echoed back out into the page here, it's completely it's complete inert. It's not going to be allowed to run because the browser was told not to run it unless it had a nonce attribute that was valid. Mm -hmm. Page load? Uh, well, I guess a request to an HTML page from the top level, like the URL and the URL bar of the browser. Ah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great. You, know, you, you understand this. You understand the problem perfectly. So you need to make sure the nonce is long enough that it would be impractical for them to, uh, to iterate over all of them. Yeah, like in this example, ABC123, that's way too short. I should have made it longer. I should have included a dot, dot, dot or something. Yeah, that's way, way too short. Yeah. Cool. Um, great. So that makes sense. Um, so there's one problem, though. Some browsers don't support this strict dynamic thing yet because it's really new. In particular, Safari doesn't support it. And so we have to decide what are we going to do um, when uh, Safari, uh, when Safari uh, users come to our site. So one thing you can do is you can, uh, so, so the way that uh, content security policy works is that the browser will ignore things that it doesn't understand. So it will ignore strict dynamic and it will ignore nonce. And so what we can do is we can just sort of have these other uh, really unsafe properties in here saying like load scripts from anywhere and let code run in line. And when Safari sees this, it's going to say, okay, I'm, I'm just basically applying uh, no sec security policy here. Uh, and if you do that, then, um, then Safari will sort of, the code will, will work and this won't break your site. And then when you run it in, a, in a, a br another browser like Chrome or Firefox uh, or Edge or whatever, then it will see this and it will say, okay, strict dynamic and nonce actually tell me that if those are present, I'm supposed to ignore any of these other ones. And so you can sort of in both, in, in, in a single policy, you can actually have fallbacks for browsers that are, that are old. Because these, these, this actually won't, won't run at all in a modern browser. So this policy is actually great. It, it, it doesn't really protect the Safari users, but hopefully um, the fact that most of your users are protected is, 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 uh, is good enough. And uh, that would hopefully discourage an attacker from bothering if they can, if they can only um, sort of target a smaller percentage of your users. But you could also here, you could also include the full list of domains uh, that you know um, should be used here as well if you want. Uh, I just, I'm too lazy, so I just put star unsafe in line and I just figure those, those users, sorry, sucks to be them. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. So for a single page, like is there only one, one nonce used, say like a script requests like another script, for example, like would, would that script like also misuse the nonce? 
So that's a great question. So if you've included a script tag like this one here, trusted.com, and it includes a nonce, it can just dynamically create DOM elements that are scripts and add them to the page, and it doesn't have to even include a nonce. The fact that it is, it is the code inside this script that is running will, will implicitly allow it to just do that. The browser won't like, restrict that script in any way from, from adding other scripts. The trust cascades, basically, automatically. It doesn't have to change its code at all. Like it, this code doesn't have to be aware that nonce is even a thing. Like it can just it can just add scripts to the page. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. So. Uh, so here's just an example of a reasonable starter CSP header you could use if you're building a site. Um, okay. A few other things. So there's this other thing called feature policy, which is kind of cool that lets you say, um, uh, I want to completely disable certain browser functionality in my site. And this is yet another way we can sort of um, limit the damage an attacker can do. Uh, so you can say, like, the geolocation API, like, I don't want, if an attacker gets code running in my page, I don't want them to be able to get the user's current location uh, or something like that. And there's a whole list of other ones that they're planning to add, which are not currently supported, but which eventually will let us sort of ban a bunch of uh, browser features that we just, we know that we're not using. And so why would we want to let our, an attacker use, use that uh, as well? Yeah, there's a really, there's, the web can do a lot of things. Uh, in particular, there's a thing on Hacker News the other day, uh, I think yesterday, about this thing. Uh, people were uh, using the ambient light sensor to uh, fingerprint users. Uh, yeah, because they, they could, sites could literally look at the light conditions in your room without a, without a prompt at all. So they could just tell, are you in a light room or a dark room? And like, uh, apparently, like that's yet another way to sort of get another data point on a user. Um, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that Pete is going to talk all about this on Thursday. Uh, huh? I, I guess it's using the light sensor on your phone. So, oh, on the phone. yeah, it's probably next to the next to the camera. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, uh, so oh man, we have like three minutes. I wanted to mention one other kind of XSS called DOM-based XSS. Um, so, the idea behind this is that the DOM can be modified by uh, by a script that's running in the browser, and we might uh, we might actually trust this script. But it's possible that an attacker could trick that script into adding some DOM nodes to the page that we uh, that we don't want it to add. So uh, unlike reflected or stored XSS, the attacker is not actually changing the HTML that the server returns. But what they're doing instead is they're somehow at runtime getting the, um, getting the page to do something unsafe like this. So why is this unsafe? This is fetching like my bio. Like say this is a social network. It's fetching like Frost's bio. And then that's going to go into a string. And if that contains HTML, that what this is doing is it's adding it to the page and it's saying, treat the HTML in this string as like actual tags. Add them to the page. So this is very dangerous. And so the correct thing to do in this situation is to just use text content instead of inner HTML, and then it will treat it as text and do the escaping for you. But you can see how this would be another XSS vector. Uh, and so this is actually the one that's more common these days because um, uh, all the kinds of client-heavy frameworks that we're using, like React, are all um, just making these, this kind of attack more, more uh, common. Um, but there's this new uh, browser spec, which is not shipping in any browser, but which is going to be coming in the next uh, year or so, which uh, also completely solves uh, DOM-based XSS. So I wanted you to make sure you, you, you all knew about it, or at least heard the name of it. Um, so, so CSP protects us from reflected and stored XSS. Uh, and then for this DOM-based XSS, the idea is if we have this kind of code like this, we would like to be able to say, uh, like, basically, we don't want to be able to say inner HTML equals some HTML string. We want, we want uh, we want to sort of make that be an error. Um, and so the way we do that is we say we use content security policy to say we're using the trusted types API, and we would like uh, all of our um, inner HTML equals code to uh, fail if it's past a string, and only to succeed if it's past something which is a type trusted HTML object. And so what that means is now what's the, what, how do we produce one of these trusted HTML objects? Well, they're going to come from a very particular sort of factory for those. And so uh, we say, what we're saying here in the, in the header is we want, our, we want to use this factory that we call template. And so we make a template uh, uh, factory. And then we give it a create HTML function. And then it takes the user input and it just escapes it. Um, but while this may look like it's returning a string here, it's actually, it, it is returning a string. But then uh, the, the, this uh, factory will actually return a trusted HTML object. And so, uh, so now if I, get back Frost's bio, and I get it back as a string here, I have to now create a trusted HTML object using this factory. And then now if I set it, it will be allowed. And so what's cool about this is literally 
the now in this example here, the only way to ever add any HTML code to the page is to go through this factory. So all other places where you might set uh, HTML strings into the DOM, all throughout your whole code base, they all must flow through this one function, uh, or else they're going to be blocked. And so now when we want to audit our code, it's a very, very easy to audit it. We just look at this function, and we make sure that this function is rock solid. If this function is safe, then we know there's no other way that anybody could have added any, uh, any DOM-based XSS to our site. Um, so that's a very interesting approach that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of. Uh, yeah, so, so final thoughts. So yeah, XSS, XSS vulnerabilities are pervasive in real-world sites. Uh, be very vigilant. Never trust any data from the client. Always sanitize it. Uh, and be aware of the context that you're using the data in. And make sure you escape it appropriately, depending on the context. And then use CSP correctly with strict dynamic. Um, and soon you can use trusted types. And if you use those two things together, you'll basically prevent all kinds of excess, all, all the kinds of XSS that exist pretty much. Uh, and, so, um, and so that's great. Um, if you do it right, you can have a site that's safe against the most pervasive uh, web attack that exists. Um, and you can never be too paranoid. So just constant vigilance. That's the right mentality. Uh, thanks. See you all later. See you, see you Thursday for the guest lecture. <laughs>